hello thank you for joining me for memory part one this is gonna be on the basics and the information processing models that we use to look at memory so here we go um, first thing about memories we gotta learn about these three kind of related terms is encoding storage and retrieval so encoding happens when we get information from the outside world it's usually novel and it's usually and or it's usually important and we take that information from one of our senses, from this, usually from this sensory memory here. Sensory memory is a fleeting memory. This memory that all these senses are bombarding our, our self every second, right? We're getting thousands of pieces of information, and our brain usually doesn't deal with most of it. It deals with a tiny little fraction of it. And it takes those little things, and it puts it in its memory for this tiny little fraction of a moment, and then it decides whether or not it's going to deal with it or not. And if it doesn't, it just drops it. And if it does try to deal with it, it starts to encode it. Um, sensory memory is fleeting. It can be any one of your senses. When I say sensory, I'm talking about your, your like the five senses, sense of touch, sense of sound, hearing, sight, all these different things. Um, and if it's important or novel, then you're going to start to encode this information. Okay, you encode this information, then finally you turn that information, you're going to store it somewhere, right? Then you're going to store it in what's called your short-term memory or your working memory, or you're going to Store it in your long-term memory, which we which we see down here. I put STP and LTP. It should say STM and LTM down here. Um, and then after you it goes from one of these two places, you retrieve it, right? You retrieve that information. We're gonna look at this more in depth as we go on. But short-term memory is a memory in between when you you find it. It's between you get your sensory. It goes from sensory to long-term. I'm sorry, sensory to short-term to long-term. And in that order, usually, okay? We'll have, there's a couple exceptions, and we'll mention those in a moment here. Um, it's easy to, easier to think of memory like a computer, right? A computer takes information from the outside world, and it translates that information, and it puts it somewhere, and then you can take that information and get it out. So, for instance, uh, if you're typing an essay for your English class, you're typing on your keyboard. When you hit the letter E, right, you hit the letter E, that information, that E, is translated into an electrical signal, which is sent through those little wires, right, into your hard drive. And that information is stored there in your hard drive, right? When you, Every time you press save, it's stored in your hard drive. Or nowadays, if we're using Google stuff, it's stored somewhere in the cloud up there where we'll never, we don't even quite understand, right? And it's stored there. And then, when you want to print that essay out to give to your teacher, you retrieve that information. Or if you want to open it up again, after your computer was turned off, you retrieve that information, right? So that's just like kind of how memories work. We Memories, instead of pressing the key, uh, sensory information is pressing our brain, right? It presses our brain. And then our brain s translates that sensory information into a neural impulse, which is an electrical signal, and sends that somewhere in our brain to be processed, right? And then if, it's, uh, if, we, if our brain chooses to do something with it, They'll store that information, and then we can later go back and retrieve that information depending on how well we, we encoded it in the first place, right? Um, there's a couple problems with the perfect, you know, this perfect analogy. Um, the, the difference is, is, you know, computers are very accurate. If you press the E, it's going to translate into an E every time unless you're, right? Your brain doesn't always translate the sensory information correctly. You might interpret it in, in the wrong or different way, right? Mental illnesses are one uh, instance of this. And computers are much faster at processing information, but they you know, work in an algorithmic pattern. right? They have to go from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, and they always have to do every single thing in order. Whereas your brain, well, it might be, it's a lot slower than a computer, but it's, you know, it's kind of cool because it can take all these different things all at once and deal with every single one of them all at once, at the same time. Right, without you even realizing it, without you having to focus your attention on it. All right. Um, so how does this encoding, retrieval, storage, all this stuff work? Well, there's a couple of uh, models, actually three. We, we'll talk about one here, connectionism. This is a modern view of memory and memory retrieval. We don't spend a lot of time on it. It's not a, it's a model that's kind of hard to put down on, on paper to get a good look at it, but it's this idea that everything's interconnected. All your memories are interconnected. And their connections and how they relate to each other helps how de determines how well you can retrieve it. And everything's just sort of like this big web in your brain. 
which is a pretty accurate view of kind of how it is, of, of modern understanding of it, but it's not very easy to kind of understand. So we kind of simplify it. Uh, in 1968, two guys, Atkinson and Schifrin, so it's called the atkinson schifrin model, or sometimes called the three-stage model of information processing. It's also called the three-stage model. Uh, it's not the one that's currently uh, used. We use the modified one, but it was the, the first, so we, we give a little credit to it. Um, in the first, you encode, you get some, some sort of sensory information. That information is encoded into, uh, into storage. And then you um, take that information and you, you it storage is a you know, short-term memory. And then that information then goes to your long-term memory. You know, it's encoded again into your long-term memory. So it goes from sensory memory to, to short-term memory to long-term memory. And it's encoded along the way. The modern or the modified three-stage processing model is a bit different. It adds in here, like I mentioned earlier, working memory. Um, and working memory is a bit more accurate. It's more mo uh, modern understanding of how memory works. Memory doesn't just go one way. We don't just put it in long-term memory and then it magically shows out. It's, working memory is kind of like a flashlight. It's what your brain is able to handle at any one time. Your brain's only really able to handle seven, seven plus or minus two pieces of information at any one time. Uh, pieces or chunks of information. We get more into that in the, in later in these memory videos. But um, the working memory, if you can think of it like kind of like a flashlight, it's whatever you're flashing, your, your brain's flashing information, whatever it's focused on, whatever that light's on, that's what your brain's able to process at that moment. So it's not just short term, it doesn't just, it's not just there for a short period of time, it's actually the working memory because you can cut back to that working memory over and over again throughout your life or throughout, you know, whatever you're doing. Um, in addition, um, you can actually, um, the modified model says you can actually go from sensory, let's see a different color here, you go from sensory straight to long-term memory, right? And this usually happens in some sort of flashbulb memory instance, which we'll talk about again later. Um, so for instance, a modern example of a flashbulb memory, something that's very tragic, something that's usually highly emotional. Um, a modern example would be the uh, Twin Towers being attacked in 2001. If you were alive and around, you probably remember where you were where you were, what you were feeling, what was going on, who you were with during that time. It just, you didn't have to encode that information in your short-term memory. It went straight to your long-term memory and there's, you're probably not going to ever, ever be able to get rid of it even if you wanted to. So here's kind of a look at it again. Um, so you've got this external event, right? You have this external event. Uh, you see something, you hear something, whatever it is. All right. And you're going to take this and you're going to, you're going to, transfer in the form of a sensory input, right? So a sensory input, that's a sound wave, that's a light wave, it's whatever, it's some sensory input, since it's like your five senses, right? However, you that's how we get, get information from the world around us is with our senses. So sensory input, and then that goes into your sensory information. Um, and then if, you, if it's important enough, right? If it's novel or important, then We'll encode it, right? We encode stuff that's novel or important, right? So if we think, oh, that looks different, one of the reasons why we do um, the color coding notes from that, from another video is because it, those color coding notes are, are novel. We're used to reading black and white, blue and white, whatever. And when we see a psychologist's name, for instance, in blue, that's novel for our brain, and so we learn to associate that. It helps encode that information a bit better. Um, when we encode that information, again, it goes into our working or short-term memory. Again, the more, probably the more correct term is working memory. Uh, and then we take that working memory, if we really want to do something with it, we continue to work with it, we can encode it further into our long-term memory. And then once it's in our long-term memory, once we file it away, we can retrieve it, and it can go back into our working memory again. Right? So we can go back and forth, back and forth throughout the rest of your life. And uh, that's kind of a, just a visual example of the modified three-stage model of memory. Thank you.